There's an old saying that says, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I'd give it in French, but it's not so good. Uh, that phrase is particularly apt uh, regarding Vladimir Putin's recent return to the presidency. Although his stand-in, Dmitry Medvedev, has occupied the post for the past four years, everyone knew that Putin still held the real power. And now he has stepped into the spotlight again, ending the charade. Although there is no sign of a significant change in his course, this is a good time for us to take stock of where things stand in terms of the domestic situation in Russia and in its foreign policy, especially regarding U.S. interests. On the domestic front, there is good news and bad news. First, the bad news. The regime continues to monopolize power, with corruption entrenched throughout the entire government structure and reaching far into the economy and the general society. Moscow persecutes human rights activists and the political opposition, including banning parties, forcibly breaking up rallies, and jailing and beating those who dare to defy it. Several perceived enemies have actually been killed, even murdered, as one of our witnesses will recount today. But there are also hopeful signs that the Russian people have begun to stand up to the regime and demand their basic rights. The massive demonstrations that followed last December's parliamentary elections, which were characterized by open fraud, have demonstrated that the people are using their fear and are demanding fundamental political change. On the foreign policy front, however, I'm afraid there is only bad news. Putin is escalating his anti-American rhetoric and accuses the U.S of one anti-Russian plot after another. But it isn't just rhetoric. His actions constitute a direct threat to U.S. interests and those of our allies. Regarding Iran, Russia continues to block efforts by the U.S. and other responsible nations to force Tehran to halt its nuclear weapons program, thereby encouraging the Iranian regime to press ahead. In Syria, Russia is helping to prop up the Assad regime by blocking UN Security Council resolutions that are aimed at stopping the ongoing atrocities. Russia is sending warships to Syrian ports, selling weapons to the Assad regime to be used not only against its own people, but potentially against Israel and other U.S. allies. Putin's determination to expand Moscow's influence was demonstrated most dramatically by the invasion of Georgia in 2008 and Russia's continuing occupation of major areas of that U.S. ally. Russia has suffered no significant cost from the West as a result of this aggression, which can only encourage it to use force in the future. Not surprisingly, Russia's threat to NATO is growing. Russia has said that it will aim its missiles at NATO if the U.S. does not abandon its efforts to establish a missile defense shield in Europe against Iranian ballistic missiles. Independent experts agree that the planned missile defense poses no danger to Russia whatsoever, and Russian technicians know this as well. But Russia's real purpose is to establish a veto over NATO policy, as well as to demonstrate to the countries in Central and Eastern Europe that membership in the Atlantic Alliance will not protect them from Russian influence. And in our own neighborhood, in our hemisphere, Russia has become a friend to a number of U.S. enemies, including selling large quantities of uh, conventional weapons to the Chavez regime in Venezuela. I don't know of anyone who expects Russia's policy toward the U.S. to change for the better. So what should the U.S. do? The most important step must be to stop giving Moscow one concession after another get, and getting virtually nothing in return. In pursuit of this so-called reset, the U.S. has handed Moscow a one-sided agreement on strategic nuclear weapons, removed sanctions on Russian companies known to have aided Iran's weapons program, and signed a very lucrative nuclear cooperation agreement, among many other concessions. The most recent gift was the U.S. approval last December of Russia's entry into the World Trade Organization, including pressuring our ally Georgia to go along despite the fact that Georgia continues to occupy its territory. Russia's entry into the WTO with U.S. support is astounding, given Russia continues to be one of the biggest violators of intellectual property rights, robbing U.S. citizens and U.S. companies of billions of dollars every year. For years, the Russian government has promised to stop this piracy, but too many of the regime's supporters benefit from it. So the theft continues. 
and now the administration is seeking to give Russia permanent normal trade relations. This requires lifting the restrictions of the Jackson-Vanik Amendment. That amendment has long been a symbol of U.S. commitment to human rights and democracy in Russia. Removing Russia from its provisions would be interpreted in Moscow and elsewhere as a seal of approval from the United States Congress, even as the human rights situation in Russia continues to deteriorate. I hope the Congress will not grant one more concession to Russia without first holding Moscow accountable for actions that run contrary to U.S. national security interests and to such foreign policy priorities as the promotion of human rights and democracy. There are many more issues with Russia that could be added to this list, and I look forward to discussing these and other issues with our distinguished panel.